we just turned three. Um, for those of you who have been around since the beginning, that's crazy to me. Um, so uh, I know I've been up here talking, but I didn't properly introduce myself. My name is Matt Hill. I'm a co-founder and CEO of Start9. Uh, Start9 um, essentially is a sovereign computing company. Um, we have chosen sovereign computing um, because we believe it accurately reflects what we're doing. Um, and this contrasts with two other computing paradigms that we compare ourselves to. One is personal computing, and the second is cloud computing. Um, I think everyone in here is fairly familiar with these two terms, but I'm going to very quickly just kind of like define them in my own way, just so we're all speaking the same language here. Personal computing is a phrase that came along in the 1970s and 80s, really, that said any individual or family could run their own personal computer. Um, this was in contrast to what came prior, which is that any super geek and hobbyist could run their own computer in a way that wasn't very practical for their normal lives, but was some sort of like extracurricular hobbyist thing that they could do. Um, Microsoft, IBM, and Apple uh, solved that. They brought these esoteric, unusable, useless things called personal computers uh, to the masses. And it turned out to be, quite frankly, one of the biggest moments in human history. Uh, I know it's pretty recent human history, but I actually think the future will also view it this way. It was a big moment for humanity because what computers did, personal computers did, was they were the essential tool of the brain. They set our brains loose. They allowed our brains to now have the power of computation behind what they already had, which was uh, reason and um, imagination. Now you had computation to back it, and so we were sort of unleashed at that point. Um, and personal computers had their heyday for about two decades. And then what happened was this idea of cloud computing came into play. And cloud computing uh, emerged out of it a need, which was that personal computers were super lonely. They were uh, totally siloed and isolated, and you had this computer in your home, and you could do word processing and maybe play solitaire, but you couldn't really connect with the world. And you definitely could not you know, go elsewhere in the world and pull up a different device and access the same information that was in your home. There was no, there was nothing in the sky that was syncing everything together and connecting you with other people. And so, you know, AOL and, you know, Internet Explorer um, and Netscape Navigator came about and sort of connected computers to one another such that you could engage with your fellow humans and so that you could maintain a private, um, globally accessible data store for yourself. And this was like super powerful, right? I mean, this was a huge moment, again, akin to personal computing in the history of developed human history. And it came only a couple of decades after the first one, right? So these things are happening faster and faster, right? Like there was in the past, you know, a few hundreds or even thousands of years would go by before there was a leap in technology that fundamentally changed the, the way in which humans existed on this planet. And as technology improves, the, the, the distance between new leaps is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And so there's a lot of people even today who look at the current state of computing on this planet, which is primarily defined by cloud computing. That is the, the predominant way in which all of us use computers is cloud computing. And you can define that simply by saying the devices that are in your pocket and in your home, your laptops, your desktops, and your cell phones, are actually mostly remote controls. They are not themselves doing the data storage and data processing. They are remote controls that are operating computers that are in bunkers somewhere else and are owned by someone else. So there's a common phrase, uh, the cloud is just someone else's computer. Um, we say it a lot, it's a very real phrase. Um, when you use your cell phone, you are using somebody else's computer. 
Your cell phone is just a screen. It's a remote control. Um, and so a lot of people take this as the culmination of the computing revolution. They actually view cloud computing, the current com computing paradigm, as sort of like what humans are going to do forever. But if you look at this from the scope of history, this is a blip in the radar. Cloud computing has only exist for, existed for 20 years, and it very quickly followed a completely different computing paradigm called personal computing that had likewise only existed for about 30 years. So we think cloud computing was just a blip in the radar stepping stone towards the actual computing paradigm, or at least the next computing paradigm, that will define how humans and computers interact with one another, what that relationship is like. And so, if you're not super familiar with the consequences of cloud computing, let me enumerate them for you for a second. When you are engaged in cloud computing, which every single person in this room is right now, um, what you are doing is essentially asking permission. Everything that you do is intermediated, right? So if you send a text message to your friend, that text message is going from your cell phone to some computer that you don't own to your friend's cell phone and back and forth. So it's as though you're having a conversation with an employee from WhatsApp sitting in your living room with you, okay? And if, if, you, if you really understand that, it becomes absurd, it becomes an intolerable. You would never have a conversation with your spouse or child with some employee from Facebook just sitting there listening <laughs> and, and taking notes and then like shouting out on a bullhorn to everyone behind them what you're saying so that they can send you advertisements. But this is essentially the nature of computing in the world today. And we've largely accepted it because the consequences were not immediate and severe. They were indirect and mild, okay? Meaning they were sort of in, just kicked under the radar. You didn't quite realize the connection between the way that you were using computers and the consequences of that action. What has happened in the past few years, especially, is it has started to hit home with people what's actually happening here. There is a movement towards digital privacy. And you only need to look so far as an Apple billboard to realize this. If you look at a Apple billboard in any given city, it says one word on it, which is privacy. Okay, Apple, the biggest computing company in the world, the biggest company in the world, is pushing privacy. And they're pushing privacy because that's what their R&D department has told them to push for. It's what their R&D department has told them will sell units. And so it's what, exactly what they should be pushing. But they are pushing privacy on their terms. Right? They're pushing custodial privacy. We, Apple, protect your privacy. We are still in possession of everything about you. But we'll protect it. You can trust us. And of course, then Google competes and Microsoft competes. And now everyone wants custody of your super private information uh, so that they can protect it on your behalf. And what we have done is decided there's another way, that there's a different answer to this entire paradigm, that we don't need to trust anyone, that it should be possible for an individual to utilize a computer or many computers without handing the data over to anyone, without giving custody of the data or the communication channels over to anyone. Um, and so when we set out to fulfill this vision, we realized that it was kind of a big deal, that it was not going to be easy to do, okay? Like, you can't just do this. The, the fiber optic cables and ISPs and router technologies are not designed for you to be able to use a computer in a way that is independent, private, and sovereign. And so we had to start getting very creative about how to leverage brand new technologies um, 
along with commodity hardware to make it possible. And this was three years ago when we really set out to do this. Um, and what we had done, so I, I'm gonna, by the way, just FYI, I'm gonna keep this to about another 10 minutes. I have a decent pulse on the emotion of the audience right now and the, the panel was good and long, um, but so you're not in for a 40 minute talk right now. I'm just trying to set expectations, 10 minutes. Um, so what we did, was we identified a couple of principles that would make what we thought was the future of human computer interaction possible um, without compromise, like the ideal vision of humans and computers. And more specifically, which I'll get into in a minute, robots, okay? Because that's ultimately what this is all about. The world is not staying digital. It's getting physical very fast, okay? Your IoT devices, everything's getting smart very fast. And so the whole idea of custodial intermediated computing takes this very kind of horror movie turn when you start thinking about like physical devices in your life that can like actually control you. Um, so what we, what we realized was missing was the same thing that Microsoft, Apple, and IBM realized was missing in the 1970s, which was an operating system. That was the missing ingredient. There was hardware. There were boards and chips, inefficient as they were, and screens and keyboards. And there was things that you could do with those, like calculators and word processors. There were apps. But there was no way for an average person to actually like, use one of these physical devices to run apps. The middleman of a human being, an app, and a piece of hardware is an operating system, okay? An operating system is the centerpiece of the computing paradigm. It's what connects all the things that belong together, together. The human, the app, and the hardware are connected by an operating system. And the big innovation of Apple and Microsoft was that the operating system had to be accessible. It had to be a graphical user interface. It couldn't be a command line. It couldn't be something super you know, scary and weird that you could spell something wrong and your whole thing would blow up. It had to be buttons that you could use a mouse to point and click. And that is what unleashed the personal computing paradigm, was this idea that an operating system, a point and click operating system was needed to run a computer. So we just ran with that. <laughs> Worked for them. So why can't we create an operating system that would enable any human being, regardless of technical expertise or experience, to run a personal server? There are two types of computers in this world. There are clients and there are servers. Clients are your cell phone, your laptop, and your desktop. Servers are these guys. They generally don't have screens. Most people who run servers in the world today run them on virtual private servers, things that are actually sitting in a bunker somewhere else. It's unnecessary. You can run a virtual private server, but there's no reason that you can't have a server in your home. In fact, when we started Start9, we thought of this thing as a shelf-top computer. That's how we were going to brand it. You had desktop computers, laptop computers. It's a shelf-top computer. It just sits on your shelf. And what this thing can do is it allows you, from anywhere in the world, to instead of processing communications from your cell phone to WhatsApp servers to your friend's cell phone, essentially inviting a WhatsApp employee into your home, what you could do is process communications from your cell phone to this device in your home to your friend's phone and completely cut everyone and everyone out of the, out of the loop. It's a nice idea. Turns out it's really hard. <laughs> Turns out that's really hard to do. Um, which is why nobody had done it. Which is why cloud computing came about in the first place. Was because Apple and Microsoft, early founders, realized that nobody was going to be able to run one of these in their home and connect to it from anywhere in the world with impunity. So they said, we'll do it for you. We'll just run some giant one over here and everyone can connect to that one. And again, it was a nice innovation. It was very uh, convenient, but ultimately came at a massive still to be fully recognized cost 
of essentially your privacy and your freedom, um, which are big prices to pay and do not come uh, immediately and apparently. It's slow until it's too late. So what we have and what we do, we have built Embassy OS. It's an operating system, abbreviated EOS. And it is unique. There are quite a few, we'll call them plug and play devices or operating systems, and I put them in quotes because they're not really operating systems, that enable you to self-host software. So I want to run a Bitcoin node. Great. Push a button. I want to run a Lightning node. Push a button. I want to run a um, Nextcloud server, or which is basically Google Workspace, right? It's Dropbox. Um, or I want to run a messaging server so that I can text message friends and family. There are actually a couple products in the world that enable you to sort of spin this up, to bootstrap it, to use a more sort of software engineering term, that you can get up and running fairly smoothly. There is nothing, nothing in the world that enables you as an individual to indefinitely administer this thing, okay? Imagine that you have a super technical friend. You, you decide to make the leap. You're like, I'm gonna take my data off of Dropbox. I'm gonna host it myself out of my own home. I'm gonna share it with friends and family. When I take a picture of my daughter, it'll get shared with my friends and family and Apple will have no idea that this photo even exists. Let's say you make that decision. There's a couple ways for you to do this. The tried and true one, the one that's existed for 20 years, is to hit your command line, set it all up yourself, download the open source software, compile it, install it, host it on a domain or a Tor hidden service, spin it up, share it, and I've lost all of you. Not one of you will do this. Even the technical amongst you won't do it because it's just, it's just time, it's energy, right? It's not worth it, it's not worth the effort. Um, the other way, uh, would be to, you know, um, run some variety of something like this, like some sort of device or cloud device that allows you to sort of just like click a button and get it spun up and, and do that. Um, the th but what's really going to make it possible for you is not just to get it spun up. So let's say I'm your super technical friend, okay? You know me. And you go, Matt, I want to run a Bitcoin node, a Lightning node, a self-hosted photo service, and a self-hosted messenger service. And I go, I can do that. I'll come over to your house next weekend. So I come over, and I grab your old laptop or your Raspberry Pi, and I just hack away. And I start typing all sorts of stuff, and I'm like, don't bother me. Go to the other room. And I just install a bunch of stuff on your computer. And then I write down a few notes before I leave and I say, okay, here's the address that you can access your thing at, here's this, here's this, and like, see ya. And I leave. And you're gonna be really happy. You're gonna be like, wow, I, I have a self-hosted file server that I can share photos with family from, no big deal. What I didn't tell you is that none of this shit works. Networks break down, software changes, dependencies change, device gets too hot and something shits the bed. It's just like, administering a server is a thing. People make $200,000 a year or more administering servers at companies. This is like a huge job. It's called a systems administrator, or in some cases a DevOps engineer. They're slightly different jobs, but it's like a highly esoteric, highly trained skill set. Getting something up and running is the easy part. Having it run in perpetuity under your control without having to ask everyone for help, that's almost impossible. That's why Microsoft exists. It's why Apple exists, Google exists. They exist because you can't do this. They're doing it for you and they're just giving you a remote control to use it. So having a friend come over and set everything up for you and then walk away might make you feel good for a day but it doesn't actually solve your problem. You as an individual, a non-technical, untrained individual cannot maintain a personal server indefinitely without the constant help of your friend. So that's the problem we set out to solve. There's a few other projects in the world that will get you feeling good real quick. They'll get you up and running, 
but the second anything goes wrong, you're, you're dead in the water. They can't help you, you can't help you, there's nobody to help you, your money's gone, your data's gone, there's no backups. It's just a disaster scenario. So what we have done that is unique is that we have taken a long-term, low-time preference, uncompromising principled approach to bringing personal server technology to the world. We envision a future where not every, as I stated earlier, not every individual on Earth is going to be running a personal server, but I can run this for my family, such that me and my wife and my daughters and my, even my f close friends can have a fully private <coughs> network where we can text message each other, share photos with each other, transact with each other, basically do anything with each other that you would ordinarily do on your phone or laptop with your friends and family. Then this can actually network with other people's organizations and families such that we can now, me and my family, can transact with other people's families. We can pay babysitters, we can hire this, we can go to the store and buy groceries. But none of it, not one drop of any of it, involves a tech giant, a bank, or a government. I just listed the three most powerful institutions that the world has ever seen. Banks, tech giants, and modern governments. And I just described a form of computing, which is the most powerful tool the human race has ever known as being able to exist without them. That's cool, but it also is extremely dangerous. Right? For who? Who's it dangerous for? Probably for me at some point. But not for the individual. What we think we have done here is, in part, we're not the only ones doing this, by the way. There's a whole ecosystem of people creating decentralized, open source, self-hosted technology. Bitcoin being the, the premier hero of the entire story. Um, we think that technology, this technology, Bitcoin included, will be, in retrospect, not a product or some sort of like new cool toy that you get to play with. We think that this will be a pivotal moment in human history where the relationship between humans and computers was redefined as a proprietary, sovereign, independent relationship. And as I mentioned earlier, and this is sort of where I'll wrap this up, this does not stop at text messages and photos and transactions. The future, if any of you think that the future is anything but a proliferation of robots serving your every need and your home's every need, you're wrong. It's happening whether you like it or not. If you walk into an Apple boardroom, a Google boardroom, or a Microsoft boardroom, this is it. That's their thing. This is what they're doing. They are trying to proliferate the number of physical devices in your life that satisfy your physical, real world needs and to have every piece of that device and the data it produces fed directly to their cloud. And this is not some evil plot to spy on you and control you and create a horrific future. This is the, this is the land grab. They're viewing this as purely a commercial enterprise. This is just the most rational thing they could possibly do as a business to lock in future profits, is to make sure that every smart device in your life is plugging into their cloud at a monthly subscription. And with all the data being fed to them so that they can custody it, tell you you're super safe, and then sell it to the highest bidder. We are capable of replicating that exact same future, the robot future that we all should want, by the way. This is an awesome future. <laughs> I can't wait to have <laughs> like my whole home just serving my needs. And I mean, it's just like this is humans and robots belong together. Technology is not evil inherently. It is possible to have a fully integrated 
robot future where your entire home, your workplace, your cars, everything is, in, everything is smart. Everything is connected. Everything is serving you. Everything is collecting data. I'm going to do a sidetrack here just for a second here because it's something I've been thinking about for years and I want to get it off my chest. My ideal physical device, like what I want more than anything is just an individual, very private desire here, is a actually proliferation of devices all over me that are just tracking everything, everything. My respiration, my heart rate, my blood composition, uh, what I ate, the composition of the air around me. Like I just want, I want devices, obviously non-intrusive because I don't want to like things hanging off of me. They should be like micro and I can't even see them. But like I want devices all over me that are just collecting data in ways that human beings could never even imagine possible that are just collecting data, 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 and then using algorithms and big data arrive at correlations that I couldn't even imagine. Like for instance, I don't feel good today, right? I'm kind of lethargic. And this thing is like, did you know <laughs> that the last time you, the last eight times you felt lethargic, you ate asparagus six days before? I'm like, I didn't get, what? <laughs> like, are you kidding me? Like, I, things that we never could have possibly imagined being correlated to one another through a massive proliferation of sensors and data aggregation and analytics. That exact future that I just described, if all of that data is plugging into Apple's cloud, is the worst nightmare I've ever heard. <laughs> so we have these like dual futures being presented to us right now where it's like, this is happening. Those sensors are happening. That data collection is happening. The question is, who does it belong to? Does this data collection belong to you so that you can use it for yourself and potentially sell it anonymously to the grid for the broader benefit of the human species and essentially earn an income simply by tracking your own data and selling it anonymously to the grid. Sounds nice. Almost sounds like an income without having to do much. Or are these sensors and data owned by people who have sold them to you on rent as subscriptions and essentially making you their subject. Um, both are possible, and we actually feel very strongly that ours is going to win because it makes the most sense. Uh, I actually can't really imagine a future for humanity under the, the boot description of the authoritarian one. Might last for a little while, but I think, it, I think it's actually going to die a pretty pathetic death. I think it's going to peter out pretty, pretty pathetically over the next two decades. Um, especially if we and others continue to do what we're doing, which is just build technology that crushes it. So, um, all right, long and short of it, that's what we do. Uh, we're called Start9. You can go to start9.com to check out more. Uh, we've been in the market for three years. We've been selling these all over the world for three years. It works really well. Um, we're still in beta, technically. We're probably remaining in beta longer than most companies would just because we have a really, really, really high standard of what constitutes a, like, done product works really well. Our customers are very, very happy, but, um, but we, over the next year, intend to come out of beta and have something that we deem ready for actual mass market um, grandma. Grandma ready in a year. So, um, yeah, give it a try. Any questions? I got some shirts, like multiple of them. So any good questions or whatever, I'm just going to get some shirts out. Super quick question. Um, very non-technical person here, but so have you actually built your own OS? It's not Linux or something like that? You're oh, it's definitely built on Linux. Okay. Everything is built okay. on Linux, <laughs> except Windows. Um, and that's unfortunate for Windows. But um, yeah, yeah, we're built on Linux. We're a Linux distro. Uh, we essentially take Linux and all the things that you would do on Linux to self-host your own software, which is like, you know, a massive amount of work on the command line and networking interfaces and writing scripts to perform health checks. And I mean, it's just like being a systems administrator, self-hosting your own software, again, not just getting spun up, but doing it successfully over time is just a massive endeavor. 
And so what we have done is taken that entire skill set and encoded it into an operating system that um, is built on Linux and ultimately results in buttons on a screen that you can touch and feel the power of a super techie person. You project well, sir. So, uh, great question. Um, so I have two slightly tangential answers to that. Well, both direct, but in different angles. Um, so one is that in order to use our technology, you don't have to do business with us at all. The code is just sitting out there. We offer downloads for free. You can download the operating system for free and install it on your own Raspberry Pi, right? You don't need to do business with us. And um, in the very near future, weeks, we will be offering a uh, x86 version of our operating system also for free that you will be able to basically convert your old laptop into an embassy. Like you'll be able to take almost any, you know, mini PC or old laptop or desktop or Raspberry Pi that you have laying around your house, download a binary, follow three easy instructions and that thing will just be an embassy. Um, obviously it should have some decent hardware <laughs> attached to it or you're gonna have a very bad time. But, um, but yeah, so getting up and running on our, on our product and technology uh, is easy and will become easier. That's actually a primary principle of ours is to make sure that this is, uh, that there are minimal, if no, barriers to entry for anyone on earth to be able to use our tech and, and connect globally to anyone else. Um, but to Uncle Jim it was the second part of your question. So anyone who doesn't know who Uncle Jim is, Uncle Jim is your uncle who is super techie and kind of always on the, you know, hip side of things and knows tech that you don't and gets it set up and, and, and lets you use it. Um, so this is the mythical Uncle Jim. Um, our product is designed to be Uncle jim by design. It's something that we actually uh, design in accordance to. Like we actually build our, our software imagining that this is a primary use case uh, by which people will adopt our technology. So if you, for instance, have uh, an embassy, whether it was purchased from us or uh, DIY'd by yourself, there are many services on the embassy, like messaging. So take Synapse, for instance. Synapse is an implementation of the Matrix protocol and a service that we offer uh, for Embassy OS. Um, you can install Synapse, trivially. Button, 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 done and then um, give friends and family the URL. It's just a website. They just open up a web browser, go to a website that you give them, and then they can create an account. They'll enter a username and password, just like they would for any other website, create an account, log in, and then chat. So you and your friends and family would all be communicating through a single device that is in your home. So you could create entire communities, group chats, um, for data, for messaging, for finances. Uh, and you, the server administrator, the person who has the physical device and root access to the device, um, are sort of the new Google <laughs> for your friends and family. And we think this is OK. We actually don't mind trust. Trust is fine, as long as it's scoped and earned. Yeah. All right, so I, along with probably some other people here, I have my own website. So one of the problems that I see becoming more worrying in the future is when you're on someone else's server, and I'm also non-technical, so I apologize if I'm framing this wrong, but would this product somehow give you the ability to put your own slice of the internet or website on a sovereign device like this, or is that something separate? Um, no, we, we called this an embassy for a reason. And it's an embassy because what is an embassy, right? 
An embassy is sovereign territory, sovereign land in another person's territory, right? So many people make the mistake of thinking that what we are selling is a router of sorts. This is some sort of gateway to the internet that'll keep you private, right? Some sort of like cloaking device for the internet. If you use our device, then you can like do the internet, but be private and anonymous. That's not what this does. That's a VPN. This is territory. This is a physical stake in the ground on the internet. It's physical land, digital land, you know? And with it, um, you can, yeah, invite others to come and store data there and process communications through it. It's your territory um, on the internet. So for hosting a website, for instance, we currently have a service. We call them services um, as opposed to apps, but just FYI, whenever I say the word service, you can think the word app. The reason that we call them services instead of apps is because apps have acquired a particular part of the brain over the last two decades or 15 years, which means a thing on your phone that you can click. It's like a, you know, it's like an icon on your phone, that's an app. These things are sort of running in the background. They're more powerful than apps. They're like what apps need to work. They're the, the engine underneath the car. So we call them services just to make the distinction clear. Um, but you can um, run a service that we built called Embassy Pages. So Embassy is our device, Embassy OS is our operating system, and Embassy Pages is a uh, website hosting service that we built in-house that essentially allows you to take any website directory, HTML, CSS, right, and um, upload it to your embassy, which is a drag and drop, by the way. So you open up your browser, you click Embassy Pages, then you take your directory, which is your entire website, and you drag it in there, and then you assign it a domain, subdomain, and you click Publish. And your website will now be accessible to anyone in the world as a Tor hidden service on the darknet <laughs> at any subdomain that you choose. Um, this makes it largely unusable for businesses and organizations because you, know, you can't stand up in front of your employees or church congregation or something like that and be like, all right, everyone open up the Tor browser and visit this darknet website. That's how we're going to talk from now on. Um, but it is the ultimate censorship resistant, private, anonymous way to do things. And so that's where we started because we know that we don't know. Here's our, our hypothesis. If you build the back doors and safety nets first, then you can build things that are more convenient and familiar, but slightly less robust later and those things will be infinitely safer than they otherwise would have been had you not had the backdoor and safety net first. For instance, let's say Marty, who runs a blog at a ClearNet website. What's your website? TFTC.io. Okay, this is info from Marty, right? Good info. He's posting it all over the world. Let's say he starts saying things that are inappropriate. He would never, no. no, <laughs> he would never do that. <laughs> um, and, and the authorities don't want him to say it anymore. Censoring tftc.io is trivial. It's a trivial exercise for multiple parties. Okay? There's, it's intermediated at multiple stages. However, if those same authorities knew that if they censored TFC tftc.io, that it would be immediately and trivially available on blah, blah, blah.onion, then they would be less likely to censor the ClearNet website because they don't want to look like fools. Nobody wants to say, you can't do that, that's illegal, shut it down, and then have the person go, <laughs> and pop it up on the other side. They look like idiots, so they're not going to do it. We actually think that having the safety net and back door available from the get-go will deter the action against the more vulnerable aspect of the technology in the first place. So that's what we built first, and it works great. 
except for Tor, which doesn't quite work great. But we have some really cool ideas for how to do decentralized, um, censorship-resistant, robust networking that is not Tor. And if you want some more details about that, check out my talk from the Atlanta Bitcoin Conference where I go into the technical details about what our plans are for networking, uh, censorship-resistant networking. Cool. I don't know if we, so we have a demo. It's up to you, man. Yeah. Uh, how, about how long, would, how long are you guys looking at for that? The demo should take five to 10 minutes. Yeah, I think probably some, some questions will, might even be answered through the actual application of some of the things you're talking about. Should let's, we? Let's do one more and then call it a, call it a day. One at the back question. there. Yeah. yeah, super. Hi, uh, I'd like to get your reaction to the following set of statements. Any company that ships Raspberry Pis out to users and says they care about privacy are just pretending because Raspberry Pis all have backdoors in their ARM chips that ARM can use at any time to siphon out and decrypt the data on any Pi that is connected to the internet. So if a company really cared about user privacy, they would use RISC-V chips because their architecture is verified by many third parties to not have any backdoors. What are your thoughts on all those statements? Thank you. Um, <laughs> We, we started with the Raspberry Pi for the obvious reasons, which was that it's a, power, it's a powerful single board, com, single board computer um, at a reasonable price. The backdooring of the Raspberry Pi, the sort of inherent backdooring, and the risk that uh, practically poses to the average person um, is, I would argue, and we won't argue right now, but I'd love to talk to you later, is somewhat indeterminate. That there is, that it is determined to not be perfect, but for the average person's risk model, it might be okay. And it's a good starting point because we recognize that you don't reach utopia by snapping your fingers. That this is a massive, long, multi-decade uphill battle that we are fighting here to undo many decades of horrible, design decisions, and political, um, yeah, political influences. So the Raspberry Pi, we think, um, is perfectly adequate to start with and, and go to market, essentially. We have, since then, now launched an x86 version of our operating system that we are selling a device for. So this is the Embassy One. Uh, it's an all-in-one, has a Raspberry Pi inside of it. We are also, at the end of this month, and have been pre-selling four months, the Embassy Pro, which is a device that is manufactured by Purism. Purism is a, device, a company out of California that uses the Intel Nook um, board as the base of the computer. Intel, more so than the Raspberry Pi, is known to be backdoored through the Intel management engine. Uh, the reason we went with Purism as our partner is because they have developed over multiple painstaking years a way of completely disabling the Intel management engine as part of the bootloader process. So we are able to sell Intel-based devices by the end of this month that are, to the best of our knowledge, and really anyone's knowledge, unbackdoored <laughs> and very powerful. Um, we will then be expanding into Risk V over the next couple of years. It is very much on our roadmap. We want to be runnable by any and every hardware device under the sun, but you got to start somewhere, and then you just get better and better. So, you know, I acknowledge your concern. Um, you should be aware that we are aware of it. We also don't believe that it is a critical vulnerability to the vast majority of people in this world at the moment, and that we have already and are continuing to take measures to eliminate it completely. <laughs> the friend who's, who is part of their risk model. <coughs> Top 10 FBI type of stuff, yeah. They can't be saved. If you're on the top 10 FBI list, we can't help you. Thank you so much, Matt. That was amazing.